Welcome to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with your host, Phil Hawkins. And Molly Hudash. All right, welcome everybody. I am super amped because today we are talking about some of my favorite topics in the world, which is physics and chemistry. And I realize that I am very often alone in that in that field. I know a lot of students don't quite love fluid dynamics as much as I do, but in like what we're going to be talking about today, and actually for the next couple of episodes of the podcast, we're going to be doing a deep dive on how to approach the different science sections of the test. We're going to talk about how to approach the chem phys section, which is always the first section of the MCAT, and the bio section, which is the third section, and psych soch which is the, the the fourth section and final section. And so we're going to be doing a little bit of a deep dive into how to think about these sections, how to specifically prepare. Like if you find yourself struggling in the chem phys section of the MCAT, today's podcast is all going to be about how best to approach this and how to kind of change the way that you're thinking about the section. So all of a sudden you're doing less work, but getting better score improvements. Now, I will mention, you may notice that Azai looks strange if you are watching the video version of this. Azai is uh, in the throes of her third year of medical stu- school, and so she is having a little bit of a, a couple busy weeks, and so we were having Molly kind of step in. You guys will recognize Molly from the last couple of episodes. Um, but if you are new then, uh, to the podcast, uh, Molly, why don't you do a quick introduction yourself. Yeah, I am so excited to be here. Hi, guys. I'm Molly Hudash. Um, Phil, I'm so excited to be doing a podcast with you. And I love that our first podcast together is on chemistry and physics. I love that this is your favorite thing to talk about <laughs> um, because you make me excited about chemistry and physics. Um, so if any of you guys have not met me before, um, I'm the director of content and instruction here at Jack Weston. Um, basically, you may see me doing um, some of our free classes. You'll see me in our uh, course classrooms as well. Um, I do a, a whole bunch with our live teaching. Um, and then I also uh, do a lot of coordination with some of our um resources that we provide you guys, right? So um, the QBank, the Chrome extension, the flashcard system, um, these are all things that, you know, I I absolutely love working on. Um, If you haven't explored any of those resources, definitely check them out on our website. Um, All of the ones that I just mentioned are free. So definitely go and explore. Um, Of course, I also work on uh, materials for course all of those other things, right? But um, really, I I eat, sleep, and breathe MCAT, um, yeah. which hopefully, right, we could pass that energy on to you guys. Yeah, I feel like the way you just described it, it sounds a little bit like Molly does literally everything, and that is <laughs> that's I think pretty accurate. Actually, um, if there's anything going on at Jack Weston, there's a chance that Molly is involved somewhere in this. Um, yes. I personally have written every one of our 9,000 <laughs> questions in our cubing. <laughs> uh, no, not really. That's what yeah. I thought you were saying when, when you said that. No. Um, yeah, I, I do a lot of work in a lot of different areas, um, but we yeah. have such an amazing team working on so many of these amazing projects. Again, definitely, definitely check them out. Yeah. Um, as they're rolling out. Yeah. If you guys are coming to Jack West, I know we put out new questions literally every single day and Molly mm-hmm. is, is overseeing this. So I think it's fair to say she's got a pretty good understanding of questions on the MCAT and how stuff's going to be tested and how to kind of think about the different sections. And so um, we have a couple of experts here. We're going to do a deep dive specifically in the Kim Fizz today. Um, yeah. So why don't you give us a little bit of an overview of just kind of what's in the chem phys section? Like, because I, like, I think students are often are very surprised by this. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised. Um, I actually mentioned this on a podcast that Azai and I did just a couple weeks ago. Um, that when I actually started studying for the MCAT, chem phys was by far my biggest fear. Right? Like, I I didn't have the most supportive or um, excitable instructors for chemistry and physics while I was in college. Um, I really, really struggled to understand because I wasn't learning from someone who who seemed to really care, um, which is why I'm I'm so excited to be here with you, Phil. Literally coming, I, I love listening to all of your lectures because I can feel the excitement. It's huge. Um, but 
but really coming from that experience in undergrad with um, especially organic chemistry and physics, I was really scared about this section. Um, and the information I'm about to share put me at ease in a lot of ways because the chem phys section is not just chemistry and physics. Um, Phil and I were just talking about the distribution. Fun fact, your chem phys section is as much biochem as it is physics, <laughs> which is wild because there's a whole other section called biology and biochemistry, right? So when you sit down to take a chem phys section, whether it's in a full length or you're doing, um, let's say a practice exam that you can make on our website, right? You're going to see about 30%, right? Is gen chem, right? That's the, the biggest chunk in chem phys, right? Then you're going to see about a quarter will be physics. About a quarter will be biochemistry. You'll see like 15% ochem and then a little sprinkle of bio in there. Um, so just a, the round out, right? The last 5%. Um, so you really will see a huge mix of these different topics. Um, and the best thing about the AEMC is they are going to blend all of those up together. <laughs> yeah. So you, you'll that's, see a, a mix of everything. That's, I think, one of the biggest things that kind of causes students some, some difficulty is th this. I have some very strong feelings about how things are taught in undergrad and how often they don't prepare students for the MCAT or medical school or things yep. after that. And so a lot of times students are learning about all of these topics in like in boxes in their head and they're all separated. Like, so like, for example, your physics teacher never mentions the electron transport chain and your mm. biochem teacher is never going to mention like the strengths of acids, right? And like how to tell if something's a strong acid or a weak acid. And like a lot of these things are very much related. Like the, your electron transport chain acts a lot like a galvanic cell, like a battery. And so like you should be thinking about how can I connect batteries to electron transport chain and to redox stuff and to organic yeah. chemistry and like understanding like the structure of ubiquinone versus ubiquinol. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'm like, because there's a lot of things here that are very connected. But this is weird. And this is not something... Um, I, and this is this is where I feel really old sometimes. But I often talk about the old MCAT, which was the pre-2015 um, version of the test. And I am realizing now that that, that was, that was a while ago. Um, <laughs> but if we look at that, the MCAT before 2015, like you had a physics passage that was just physics questions. And it was about something like, you know, shooting lasers at the moon and bouncing light off of the moon and like using that to figure out how far the moon is. And like, it's like a really physics centric passage, mm -hmm. but the new MCAT is more about like, okay, maybe there's still stuff about lasers, but about using lasers to, um, you know, kind of like do something with a certain like analytic technique used to like measure the weight of proteins or using lasers to do like certain surgical techniques or like gamma knife surgery, which is like nuclear physics and like cancer biology at the same time. So the new MCAT is this very blended topic. And I think a lot of times students have trouble because they're not used to approaching it from like a blended perspective. And that's that's a big thing. Obviously, we do that a lot in the course, but like showing connections, right? Like how, yeah. like how does this connect to that? Like how are these things related? How is sensation, like what's going on? How is that connected to optics? And how is that connected to like um, uh, the photoelectric effect? Um, and like all of these things are absolutely connected. I just recorded a lecture on vision, which is why I'm like, <laughs> everything's vision based in my, in my brain. Um, yeah. But that makes things hard for students as they are studying for this. And it's very, very different from what you're used to in undergrad. Totally, totally. And I remember, I mean, I took gen chem and physics and ochem all in different years, right? To me, and I know I, I say this because when I was studying for my MCAT, I tried to do it this way. Um, for me, each subject lived in its own separate box. Like physics was physics. Gen chem was gen chem. And maybe there was some overlap with, with OCHEM, right? But really, like, they were so mm -hmm. separated. I think I took gen chem my first year, right? Freshman year. And then I took OCHEM junior. Like, there was even a gap. I did mm -hmm. gen chem, physics, OCHEM. And so they were so separate to me. 
right? And even with biology and biochemistry, right? Like they, I didn't really think about how physics and chemistry and biology are really describing the same thing, but almost just like on different scopes or different scales, right? Yeah. Looking at them through a different lens. Um, and I love that you bring this up because it's it helps you know what to expect when you know that these things are going to be blended, right? And you may see a passage and you're like, we're talking about the flow of, uh, you know, the filtrate through a nephron, right? Like this is biology. And yet they're not going to test you necessarily on, you know, what takes place at the glomerulus. They're going to test you on fluid dynamics, right? So it's getting getting comfortable with what you're going to see so that when you sit down to take your MCAT, you don't see something that throws you off and then get panicked, right? And have that affect the rest of your test. Um, so I love that. And honestly, <laughs> this brings up a whole nother discussion of memorization versus conceptualizing and informing those connections because that is really what the MCAT's all about. Right? Yeah. So I, I love that you're bringing this up, all those connections, because it's so crucial in not only giving you information of what to expect on test day, like literally what our passage is going to be about, but also how should we be studying content for this as well, right? Look for yeah. those connections. And that's, Since, yeah, you're exactly right. And like, that's what should be going on in your head is, okay, why, why do we care about all this like general information? Because it should be shaping the way that you're studying. Mm -hmm. um, there are a ton of students that try to approach the MCAT as like, I want to knock out physics. So I'm going to go study physics for three weeks and then bio <laughs> and then chem and then biochem and then orgo and then psych and then sociology. And all of a sudden it's been like three months since we've looked at physics. It's this yeah. is why, like, we do this in the course, but this is how you should structure your studying is you should be studying all of the topics all at the same time. And I know, I know it feels good to cross something yeah. off and say like, I'm done with physics. Like that is a very motivating thing. It is. Um, but like what you need to, like if you study physics and then you study bio and then you study orgo and then you study psych all in the same day, you're going to start to see connections between those topics. And so you should be studying these things kind of like in a mixed or blended way because that's how the MCAT tests things. Once again, this is different from the old MCAT. My advice for students on the old MCAT, like if you wanted to just study physics for a, a month, that's fine because they're not going to mix it with other topics. But now they absolutely do. Um, and this this kind of also goes, you know, comparing like undergrad to the MCAT. In undergrad, like you, let's take your physics course, for example, and maybe your physics course was different from mine, but my physics course was that there was two challenges on test day. One, do you know the equations? And two, can you do the math? Those, oh, that's, that's it. Math. Like if you know all the equations and you can do the math, you're gonna be fine. The new MCAT doesn't, like the MCAT doesn't work that way, where most of the time, the challenge you're going to have is you're going to look at a question and you're going to be like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, I know all the equations I need to know, but what are they talking about? And yeah. anybody who's done like a practice test, you guys know what I'm talking about. This just moment when you look at a question, you say, what? Like, what, how are they? And so like, for example, like if they're asking you about capacitors, right? In undergrad, like you would have an equation, like the capacitance is equal to the like some constant times the cross-sectional area over the distance between the plates. And you would solve the question by just plugging and chugging. Um, but on the MCAT, they're gonna ask you something like, what's the capacitance of the membrane of a neuron if we switch the fatty acids in the membrane for a diff smaller fatty acid. And like, there's literally nobody who has studied that. That is like, nobody has memorized an equation for that specific scenario. But if you n understand capacitors really well, and you know that, oh, like you have a plate with positive charges and a plate with negative charges. And when they get closer together, the capacitance goes up. So like if you have a membrane and on one side's positive and negative, if you make that membrane thinner, the positives and negatives get closer to each other, which means the capacitance is going to go up. And like that, the challenge there is not a math. That's not a math problem. Like it's not like the difficulty of that is not a calculation. You do need to know an equation, but I think the bigger challenge is understanding how to apply this thing um, rather than memorizing the equation. 
right? Like you have to understand, you have to conceptually understand how does a capacitor work and how can you connect that to the membrane of a neuron and connect that to lipids within that membrane, switching oleic acid for palmitoleic acid. Like that's, that's something that like, like I said, no student has seen before. And so if students are studying for physics on the MCAT, the way that they studied in undergrad, they're going to be doing like just looking through equations and trying to memorize them. And what happens is on test day, they see a question and they've got all the equations memorized, but they don't know which one to use. I always like to use the analogy. It's like if you inherited a mechanics shop and you memorized all the tools and you're like Allen wrench, pipe wrench, monkey wrench, crescent wrench. Like that doesn't mean you can fix a car, right? Like just because you've memorized all the tools. And so it's kind of a similar thing for um, for the MCAT. Is a monkey wrench a real thing, Phil? It, that I think it's like another joke. name for a pipe wrench. Ah, okay. I, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not he didn't, sure. On he that. didn't crack a smile. I think that's real. But <laughs> <laughs> my dad but, asked me to pass him the monkey wrench every once in a while, and so <laughs> I I assume it's a thing. Um, okay, okay. Might have cool. been. I, I believe you. I believe you. Yeah, I love that you bring this up because I've worked with several students who've done this, and I have had several friends who tried to do this. Right? Say, oh, chemistry and physics, especially for physics. All I need to do is sit down with my equation sheet and study it and learn it. And then I'll be good. Right. Yeah. Cause there's this idea that, Hey, the equations are super important and they <laughs> are, you need to understand the equations, but it's not just, can you regurgitate it on the test? Um, you also need to know what it means. Um, and I've had actually, this brings up a, a, a story that a friend had told me where, um, you know, they had memorized several equations that used the letter V and they 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 knew the equation, they could write it down for you, but they had no idea that sometimes V is velocity mm-hmm. and sometimes V is voltage. They had yeah. no clue. They memorized their equations, but they didn't really know what the variables stood for. And they didn't understand the context of the science that they actually fit into. So they were constantly trying to use voltage formulas for like mm-hmm. kinematic scenarios. And like, they they were like, I don't understand. I'm not seeing anything about charge. <laughs> Why am I like, yeah. <laughs> they're not talking about this. They're talking about displacement. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. what you so confused, right? Knowing your your meaning behind the equations is is so, so critical. And I think we don't really get that. We've been talking a lot about undergrad versus MCAT, right? Undergrad, you take tests periodically after every unit. So it's like, you kind of know when you take a test, like, okay, well, we were studying voltage. We weren't really talking a ton about velocity or, you know, those are just two examples, right? right? You kind of know based on what you learned in the past couple months, the MCAT covers everything, Yeah, It's really broad. So you really have to understand. You can't just memorize yeah um, you're, you're and some absolutely some, right some of the questions are going to ask things like phil suggested right like what would happen if we changed this one variable like what would that happen or what would that what effect would that have on a different one in that equation and you need to know the equation but you also need to know how to manipulate it right mm-hmm. you may get calculation questions and you may see yeah. that and you're like plug and chug even that Right. Sometimes they'll they won't be clear about what values correspond to which aspect of the equation. Right. They could tell you that a ball is initially at rest and you're like, okay, cool. But I need V naught. I need the initial velocity. And I don't see a value in there with Mm -hmm. units. And you're like, yeah, but they told you. They they did tell you. They just didn't, they weren't clear about it. They (laughs) they were trying to trick you. So it's this is why we say it's such a reasoning test, right? You have to understand the equation or you have to know the equations, you have to understand them. And then you also need to be able to pick out the pieces of the information that's provided to even know how to use them, um, which is, it is challenging until you know what you're up against, then it becomes easier. Yeah. And that's, you're you're exactly right. And I, I want to be clear, those students who come and say like, I'm just going to memorize all the equations, like they've been taught that that's the way to approach it. And so like, it's it's not that like those students have a bad like strategy or a bad idea or they're thinking about it as wrong. It's just like, oh, this is how you've been trained. And now that doesn't work anymore. And like, that's that's why the Kempis section causes students a lot of trouble is because 
the the way you've been successful at it in the past doesn't apply. And I agree, a part of it is that fact that just the MCAT is so wide. Like, yeah. when is the last time you had one test that covered nuclear physics, the photoelectric effect, circuits, kinematics, fluid dynamics, right? Electrostatics, magnetism, and electrochemistry, all in the one test. Like, probably never. If you did have a test like that, then I'm guessing you've taken the MCAT because that's yep. <laughs> pretty much the only test I can think of that would do that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, you're right. And like that context is important. Like you said, like they say it's at rest. And so you need to know the initial velocity is zero. Like that's that's one that like students should definitely be able to, to latch onto that. But there are other things like kind of fitting in that as well. Like if they give you a thing with like buoyancy, right? And you need know that you need to use the density of something in that they might give you the density of this basketball and the density of the water yeah. and the density of, of blood or density of bone is in the passage. And so you need to know specifically in the buoyancy equation, the density you're using is the density of whatever fluid stuff is floating in. And so like, it's the density of the liquid that matters. And so is this basketball floating in water, then the density in that equation should be the density of water. If we're talking about a bone, like at the bottom of a pool of blood. I don't know why that would be a passage, but oh my um, gosh. then you would use the density of blood in that scenario because it's the fluid that you you care about. And also, like if, if, if the MCAT writers, and this is something that the MCAT would absolutely do, is they would give you the density of all those things. They would also give you the density of air and then ask you about the dense, or like a balloon floating. And you need to know that air is a fluid. And so the fluid and the density in that needs to be the density of air. And most students, like some students are going to not know what density to use at all. Some students are going to like, oh, it's the density of the liquid. But some students are going to be like, oh, it's the density of the fluid and gas is a fluid. And so this helium balloon is floating in gas. And so it's the density of the fluid that matters. It's the density of the air. And that's not the air in the balloon, the air around the balloon. And like, that's, that's tricky, right? And you have to have a really good understanding of buoyancy to be able to do that. And those students that just memorize equations, they, that doesn't, that doesn't work. Um, and like, yeah. the other side of that is, like, I was saying in undergrad, there's two challenges. One is know the equation. And so like, that's how students deal with that. They just memorize the equations and that doesn't really work. And that's not how you should study. You should be focusing more on relationships and conceptually understanding. But the other part is that in undergrad, often the problem is the math. Yeah. And like the math is difficult. Like that's, there is math on the MCAT. You will occasionally do calculations, but mm -hmm. if you look at, the so the AMC has a bunch of practice resources. If you look at the section bank, right, which is from the AAMC, if you look at the very first passage, it's got three calculation questions. Question one is, what's this number divided by that number? And it's like four divided by 0. 0.5. And then there's another one that's like, what's this number times two? And then the third one is, what's this number times this number? And it's like, what's two times five? And like, like the actual calculations are stuff that I think like there are some fifth graders that I think could do like what's two times five. There's probably a third grader or a second grader that can do that. Um, and so the math is not the hard part there. But a lot of times students get super fixated on the math. And so when they're studying, they're spending way too much time worrying about that when that's not the thing they should be worrying about. And it's about yeah. understanding the test, understanding what your challenges are going to be and studying for those challenges. Yeah. One of the things I mentioned early, right, while I was introducing myself, that I work a lot on content, right? Things in our in our homework assignments for our core students, but also free stuff, right? Working on new, exciting resources that we'll be launching in the future. <laughs> wink, wink. Um, and that's something that's really important to me, right? That the resources that we create are accurately representing what students will need to do. Because I know when I first started studying, um, I was using a particular very popular book series. <laughs> and I, I started with physics and math because I was like, this is scary to me. I'm going to start here. And I was very quickly terrified because in the examples that they show, they have 10, 15 steps of calculations. You're doing hard math. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not ready for this. I can't do this. 
the math, right? Oftentimes will be simple calculations. The hard part is figuring out what to do, even for the questions that require more steps, right? It's not just one number times two, even the ones that are a little bit more complex than that. There are so many ways that you can simplify it for yourself because the best part about the MCAT, and all of you guys I'm sure will know this, but the best part about the MCAT is it is a multiple choice test. Mm -hmm. You do not need to get the correct answer within, you know, one significant digit. Like you don't need the perfect, perfect, objectively correct answer. You need to pick the best one. So there are a lot of skills that you can use right? Depending on the scenario, right? With the the relationships between the answer choices, how close they are, right? Similarities in the number versus the exponent, right? Things like that. There are things that you can do that really simplify the calculations that you do have to do, right? Even when you do have to do calculations, it doesn't need to be as scary as you probably feel in this moment that it it needs to be, which for me was a huge weight off. Yeah. That's another thing I think Once again, it kind of goes to training. Like people have been trained to be more specific, right? Like in your Mm -hmm. chemistry class, if they, if your chemistry teacher asked you, what's the pH of this solution and gave you all this information and you said, eh, it's it's probably a little acidic. Like that's (laughs) not good enough for that, (laughs) for that teacher. Or if your physics professor asked like, how fast will this baseball be going? And you're like, "Mm, it's going to start with a two. Like either 20 (laughs) meters per second or 20 billion meters per second or 0.0002 meters per second, something like that. Like that is not okay with those teachers. But on the MCAT, like that's how you should be solving some of these questions. And this is something that students are really uncomfortable with. They are really, and it has to do with how you're trained. You're trained to like figure everything out to like significant figures. And most often you can just, but there's a lot of questions where they ask, like, what's the density of blood? And like, if you just know, like, blood's pretty much just water. So it's whatever is close to the density of water is my answer. Like, there is other ways to, like, calculate things. But, like, doing that kind of lazy shortcut is is not something that you, like, can, can or should avoid. It's something you should be willing to do. And in some cases, you have to do it. And mm-hmm. so getting comfortable with that, that's why there's a whole lecture on um, in the course about like, yeah, MCAT math about like how to shortcut questions, how to, how to kind of like avoid doing most of the steps. If you can figure out, oh, it's just, the answer is going to start with a two. The answer is a, um, now I don't know if it's 2 billion or 0.2, but <laughs> a is the only one that starts with a two. So that's it. And like that, <laughs> that feels really nice when you can figure it out. Um, and I don't, I don't want to downplay this because like I said, a lot of like, you know, saying that like, oh, the there's a question on that on like from the AMC, the people who write the test, they write questions where the way to solve is take this number of times two. Like that question that I'm talking about, students do not do well on that question. Like that is question. students <laughs> do really bad on that question. Most of the students, it takes them way longer than a minute, which is what it should take. And even then they don't really get the right answer very often. I'm saying like maybe 10, 20% of students get the right answer. And so like, I'm I'm trying to just emphasize, like, don't let the math terrify you. Focus more on like understanding, like how does like wavelength and frequency of light, how do those things relate to each other? And like, that's how you solve that question is knowing how to approach these relationships and they'll, they'll kind of like connect those things. One of the things that is useful, cause I always like to give students like in office hours last night, I was talking like, Oh, if you have ever have a question that asks about velocity, your first line of defense is kinetic energy. Cause that should apply in every scenario. Kinematics will apply sometimes. And if that doesn't work, which is your second line of defense, your third line of defense is units. And so any question that you come across where they ask for velocity, like you have, okay, this is what I should think. And if that doesn't work, then this is how I should approach it. And if that doesn't work, this is how I should approach it. And like having that sort of strategy of like going through things is big especially that like using units strategy that this is something that the physicist in me hates that the MCAT is built this way, that there are so many students 
that get like a lot of correct answers and none of them understand the physics. And like the, the physicist in me is like, this is terrible. Everyone should learn about fluid dynamics because it's actually awesome. But like the MCAT instructor, the MCAT teacher in me loves this because you have a plan B for every single calculation question of like, oh, if I plan A is know exactly how to solve it. <laughs> Sometimes that doesn't happen. And then you're like, okay, well, I don't know how to deal with this. Plan B, use units. And you can use units to solve a lot of questions, like like a lot, a lot. I would say, mm-hmm. you know, somewhere between 30 and 50% of the questions on test day, like calculation questions can be solved with units. Depends on the topics, like electrostatics, most, the vast majority of electrostatics questions can be solved with units. Optics, not quite as much. So there is some, some difference there between topics, but um, units will go a long way. And there are straight up just some questions that the only way to solve it is with units. And so that's that that's kind of like, as you're studying, you should be thinking about these things, right? Don't panic so much about like, I have to be able to write all the, the equations from memory and I got to be really good at math. Focus more about, I have to understand like how all these things are related to each other and what these equations are actually telling me. And I need to understand like units really well. And I got to understand how to like, I have to understand that hydrostatics applies to fluids that aren't moving and fluid dynamics applies to fluids that are moving. And like, that's sometimes that's more important than having like a really specific equation memorized. I know that seems silly given what students deal with in undergrad, but it's a little bit different on the MCAT. Yeah. And I I love that you bring this up because it's so, so important. And I know it's so easy to be so scared of chemistry and physics, the Mm -hmm. section, because there are so many things going on that may intimidate you from your past experiences in undergrad and, you know, like (laughs) parts of your sort of student conditioning that are going to serve you poorly on this exam, right? The the way that you need to flip your thinking. Um, And I think that this is really important to touch on because it it shows how important it is to be aware of what you're doing, how you're solving things, right? What was my thought process? Why did I use this equation? How did I know that this was the variable I needed? Like how, how did I go through this? And it, you have to do a really thorough review, you guys, because if you, if you look at a, a question, that's a calculation question, and you see that you got it wrong, you're just like, oh, I'm bad at math. Okay, sure. You got to the wrong answer, but did you know the equation? Like, were you able to do, like, was it the math that was the issue? Like once you had everything plugged in, was that the problem or did you misidentify a variable, right? Or did you use the wrong equation? Did you, right, not understand what the question is asking, right? You need to be really honest with yourself, even when things feel very scary um, and very touch and go, especially if you have a fear of any any of the subjects or topics within the MCAT, right? You need to be very granular, right? Okay, calculation question, why? At what step did this question lose me? Mm-hmm. And once you figure that out, right, what kind of skills can I get in my little toolkit for the MCAT specifically that will help me here, right? It's It really helps rather than to think of it as just this one monster of a section, mm-hmm. break it down. What in this section is causing you problems? Is it the conceptual understanding of the 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 science or the equations? Is it the calculations? Is it knowing the units? What is it, right? Then it yeah. gives you something to focus on. And that's so crucial, yeah. right? For any of you guys that are scared, that that is probably your biggest step in yeah. conquering this section. I talk about this a lot in the course and outside the course, to be honest. Like, mm-hmm. You have to diagnose before you can treat, right? Somebody comes in and they're sick. You don't just give them a pill and they're better. You got to figure out what's wrong first. Same thing should be going through your head. If you missed a question, like, did you not know the equations? Did you know the equations, but didn't know which one to use? Or did you make a math error? Like those, or you misinterpreted a table, right? Like that, all of those are very different things that have very different problems. And another thing that, goes into this as well. There's there's so much to talk about with this. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is something that isn't really specific to Kim Fizz, but specific to the MCAT. And an aspect is specific to Kim Fizz. But 
in undergrad, people tend to study in sprints, right? I have a test on Friday of next week. I don't start studying until Monday of next week. And it's like, <laughs> I'm doing a sprint and like, I'm locking myself in the library for the week and then I am going to do okay on the test. And then that's fine because that works when you're dealing with smaller tasks. But the MCAT is so big that like you can't cram all of the MCAT in the week before the test. That is that is not <laughs> going to go well if you try to do that. The MCAT is a, a, a beast where you have to start studying today for mm-hmm. something three, four, five months from now. And that's that's weird, right? Mm-hmm. And so this is also kind of crossing into my other favorite topics, which is <laughs> Memory, memory and the way yeah exactly the <laughs> I know way you too well Bill. <laughs> do. like the way we learn that's something I care so much about I, I don't mention it often but like the PhD work I did was focusing on the way we learn and how to get memory to stick specifically in Alzheimer's but it applies to other stuff as well um, and so there's one experiment that I really um, like talking about where they took two groups of students and they set them down and each group of students had the same equation sheet and they both had 10 minutes to memorize the equations. And so group A was just given this equation sheet, said 10 minutes, memorize them. Group B was given this equation sheet, 10 minutes, memorize them. And you have to do these practice questions that are using those equations. And they have 10 minutes. And so in theory, group B, who has to do math problems, they actually have less time to memorize stuff because they have to figure out like what's 17 divided by two, like they have to do some math stuff in there. And so they're not just focusing on memorizing versus group A is just 10 minutes of just staring at this thing, trying to memorize it. After the 10 minutes were up, they took the equation sheets and the papers and stuff from both groups. And they asked both groups to write the equations out and they gave them blank sheets of paper. Both groups, and some people are going to be surprised by this, both groups did the same. There was no difference in terms of that like short term, like memory retention. But what happened, and this is where things get interesting, is they didn't tell these students like what was going on. They didn't tell the study participants, but they said, okay, we want to invite you back in two weeks. And so in two weeks, when they had people come back, they just gave them a blank sheet of paper and said, write the equations. And so group B the group that did practice questions did way better on that. And the reasoning for that is whenever you solve a question in your brain, there's a dopamine release and there's this subconscious, like you're not even aware of it, of like, yeah, you did it. So like whatever you were thinking about was something that you, like your brain is like, like that thing was useful for something. And so you're going to hold on to that information if you your brain found it useful at one point. Even subconsciously, this is without trying, your brain will just hold on to stuff that you can use to solve problems. And so that group that did the qu- equations, they met, remembered it better long term. And this is something that happens like that's a very like applicable study to what you guys are doing. There's a lot of students, I had a student last night say should I just work on being able to write out all the equations from memory and like on scratch paper and keep practicing until I can do it completely? And I'm like, I mean, that would help you memorize the equations maybe, but that doesn't help with, like I said earlier, the real challenge on the MCAT is often, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, how do I apply this? So if you do lots of practice questions, one, you're going to remember it better long term. And because the MCAT is a long term study thing, like that's the better way to do it. So that's that's good enough reason by itself. But reason number two is it will also help you with that scenario of seeing a question and knowing how to approach it because you've done lots of questions and you've realized, oh, this is a scenario where I can use kinetic energy. This one, I should use kinematics. And like, as you start to recognize, oh, here I can do that and there I can do that. That's also a really useful skill And this is also, like I said, it's very different than undergrad because in undergrad, that short term remembering stuff, like it doesn't matter if you do practice questions or you just try to like flashcard and memorize equations, either way is going to be the same in the short term. Long term is different though. And so all of a sudden you need to start um, kind of changing the way that you're you're approaching these things and practice questions are way more important, which is why the the Q bank is so useful that Molly spends so much time on. Um, 
And I think yeah. that that's a that's a really important thing to understand and something you should be thinking about as you're studying, um, which is, you know, why we're doing this podcast episode, because a lot of people aren't like aren't approaching it this way. I I don't just want students to be able to like handle stuff. I want them to study something today and I want them to have an easier time remembering it, right? Because there's, I, I'm guilty of this as well, of like doing stuff and like trying to brute force and cram stuff without doing, like not using the information. And so it just doesn't stick. They, I know like if, if any of you guys listening have played video games, like there's some things that you found useful in the video game for solving a problem. Like there's some video games I played when I was 10. And for some reason, I still remember how to solve this one puzzle and this one thing. And it's it's because there was that dopamine release like going on in my brain. And so without even trying it, I remember that thing. But I don't remember definitions from seventh grade or equations from seventh grade um, yeah. because I didn't yeah. use them. Yeah, I love it. I love that you connect that to to doing practice questions. And I do like that's such a push of, okay, we've got to write X amount of questions on kinematics. How can we make them diverse enough that it prepares students for all the different types of questions that the AMC could ask about kinematics? Mm -hmm. Right. If you do the same question with different numbers again and again and again, your math yeah. skills, calculation question skills might improve, maybe. Mm -hmm. But you're not really going to get any better in terms of the MCAT because right. the best and scariest thing about the MCAT is they will ask the same question in 10 different ways and they will feel like 10 different questions yeah, to you. Completely different. Right. Totally different. So having having access to high quality questions and solutions is, is amazing. Having video solutions, even better, right? Getting to work with somebody live, like in office hours, Phil and I both do it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bio biochem girl myself, Phil's our chem fizz, right? <laughs> Actually being able to work through it with someone or a tutor, right? So crucial. That will help you build this toolkit, right? It's it's so, so valuable just yeah. getting experience. Um, and honestly, I think that's that's true, not just of calculations, but of any skill that you learn for the MCAT. Right. Yeah. Like if we talk data interpretation, which that is applicable to chemistry and physics as well, there is some data interpretation. Right. Let's say that you hear a great data interpretation strategy and let's say that you can regurgitate it. They ask you to write down your data interpretation strategy. You can describe it. But can you actually carry it out yourself? Mm -hmm. Can you use that strategy to understand a data table? Right. That in ChemPhys is maybe, you know, some table filled with units that maybe should be, uh, you know, bringing to mind certain equations, like, and then you have a calculation and a data interpretation question that combines those, like, having practice, guided, targeted practice on those weak areas will make those questions that especially combine different skills so much more approachable. Yeah. Those are those are some tough ones, huh, Bill? <laughs> yeah, no, and you're you're absolutely right. Like talking about once again, how is this going to be tested? And mm -hmm. like understanding that the MCAT is going to be throwing so much at you. Like I know, Molly, like if, if I just bring up certain there's some passages that just are really crazy in physics. Like it's somebody's on a train and there's three different braking systems for the train, but there's also some capacitors and also there's a laser and also there's a pendulum and like there's You're all like, of this information <laughs> or like they do a study yes. on a bunch of like retirees that are like 60s, 70s, 80s and all different uh -huh. ages. So you have all this table of okay. data on like <laughs> how quickly they climb the stairs and what the focal length of their glasses are and yeah. how many decibels they can hear and like and like the spring of the, like the what they can yeah. pull. And so like this one passage has so <laughs> much stuff on it. It's got questions. Like I think they even go into nuclear physics and in one of the questions with that one. And so it's like nuclear physics, springs, uh, like potential energy, velocities, uh, optics, like sound and decibels. And like, it's so much stuff. And so being able to look at a question, know like, oh, I need all I need is that decibel thing. I'm like, let me just grab that. I'm like, okay, we're good. It's easy because I know how to approach it. And that that makes things start to fit a lot better. And that's like, I feel like the data interpretation, like you mentioned, there's some data ter interpretation on the MCAT or on the Kim Fizz. I don't think it's as bad as like the bio section in terms of like how many variables are like in the experiments themselves. Yeah. Uh, but there, it's still there. 
and you still need to kind of like focus on that. Yeah. Um, we'll, it, we'll touch on all the differences between data like, like interpretation and the next yeah. few, but I agree. Like so often you'll see a table and you'll just, your eyes will get wide, right? Your sympathetic mm-hmm. nervous system kicks in. You're starting to freak out a little bit, <laughs> like, right? You're like, uh, I think that that can be true of chemistry and physics, but often it's scary and just all the different aspects that they provide at the same time more than yeah. like, you know, which is true of figure one, like in terms of a trend, you know, it's yeah. the way that they ask questions about data is is very different between the different sections. And that yeah. is important to acknowledge for yeah. sure. I do think, and like that, this comes back once again to the diagnosing side of things, mm-hmm. right? A lot of the stuff we talked about today, like if you notice that you just are repeatedly struggling in the chem phys section alone, then like a lot of the stuff we talked about was today was specific to the chem phys section. So that's probably mm-hmm. where your problems lie. On the other hand, if you're struggling in like chem phys and bio, but the other two sections are fine, like honestly, it might be data interpretation. It might actually not actually be content, but those are the two sections with I think the most similar data interpretation. Psych is a little bit different as well, like kind of like from a different angle. And so just kind yeah. of understanding how the different sections work. I want to mention mm. one more thing, and this has to do with that diagnosing thing. Um, and Molly, I know it's like, you know, director of like content creation, all that stuff. Um, you're I, you're going to be happy I'm talking about this because I think it's a really important thing. But we also have our MCAT content diagnostic, which is free. And so you can go onto our website and the content diagnostic just throws you like three or four questions on every single science topic on the MCAT. And afterwards, it'll spit out some analytics. And you can be like, oh, I bombed every question on lipid metabolism. I need to go work on that. And I did really well in molecular genetics, but I did really bad in classical genetics, like Mendelian stuff. And so I need to go work on that. And so if you find yourself struggling and trying to figure out ways to improve and how to approach those things. I think diagnosing is should always be step one. And so the content diagnostic can be a really useful tool. Like I said, totally great on Jack Weston. Um, totally. Yeah. And I, I agree. Diagnosing should be step one. It should also be step three and five and seven <laughs> yeah. and nine Absolutely. and 11, all the odd numbered steps should right. be diagnosing. <laughs> Because you might take the content diagnostic the the day before you sit down and start your study plan, and maybe you're terrible at lipid metabolism. Then maybe the next week you hammer that home. You mm-hmm. really build that content gap, right? Are you still the worst at lipid metabolism? Probably not, right? You got to yeah. think. Okay, let me do some more questions. Let me see where I'm I'm bad now. Um, and you're <laughs> exactly right. I I love the diagnostic. I love all the questions that we have, but especially since we're talking about data interpretation, the analytics is such a valuable tool, Mm -hmm. right? This, in case this is new, it's a feature on our website. Any, any, uh, any questions you do, right? Again, we've got like 9,000 free ones on the website, right? Plus this also works for course students with course specific homework, right? If you submit them, all the data that we have associated with those questions in terms of like what the topics are and what the skills are, things like that, they'll all feed into that analytics page, And it will show you updated constantly. This is what you're, this is, I don't want to say this is what you're bad at. This is what you're not the best at yet. Struggling and where you should be focused. Exactly. Yeah. So I I think it's so, so valuable, right? But this, this is not a one-stop shop of like diagnose once and then you're good. You know, it's like, it's it's a constantly reflective process and it's scary to open yourself up to that, right? It's scary to acknowledge and accept the things that you are not great at, Mm -hmm. especially when for so many of us, the MCAT is tied to who we are in some of us or for some of us, right? Tied to our value, right? Mm -hmm. Our, our chances at the future that we want, right? It's so personal. And I think that we oftentimes build up, we assign so much significance to the score that gets shot out at you when you submit Mm -hmm. a practice test or, you know, a, a question set, and it's so scary. You see five out of 10. I'm 50%. You're know, like this. I'm, yeah. I'm not even, that's my value. But right. It's if you want to improve the number, right. You've got to open yourself up to reflection and really accepting 
what made that five out of 10 the case, right? That's the way to get a 10 out of 10. Um, So it really is, it's uncomfortable, but not only will that help you on your MCAT, but it's also a really important skill for, for med school, for being a physician, like you've got to be comfortable with this. And this is a good sort of audition (laughs) as a human being for, for that sort of emotional intelligence. I like that. It's, it's important for being a human being. I feel like to being a successful one, the, and you're right. And it is painful to acknowledge like, okay, I am bad at this thing. Like that doesn't feel good to talk about. (laughs) Um, And yeah, it feels terrible, but like, note that that's step one of getting better at it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, this is such a tricky, messy thing. And this is not just Kim Fizz, but it is worth talking about. Um, there's a lot of students that just feel really good about one topic. And so they're studying for the MCAT and they just keep covering that same topic over and over and over. And like, they've got all their amino acids cold, which is good because you need to know them mm-hmm. really well. And that is worth putting in time, but don't spend 20 minutes every day reviewing amino acids when you already know them really well. And so in a way you kind of want to be spending time in those uncomfortable areas. And that like, this is where I feel the worst. This is where I need to spend my whole day. And like, that doesn't feel good. And I do want to kind of like recognize that. But I think that like changing your perspective of like, this is how I become better, right? And having that sort of growth mindset is I think really useful. And it's important to kind of understand that sort of impetus and drive for just like, let's just stay where I'm happy and safe and comfortable, but that's not how you grow. And I think everyone listening to this probably wants to grow and be better and like be the best physician. And this is something yeah. I'm constantly doing. I know sometimes I I literally just messaged Molly about something the other day and I'm like, listen, I'm trying to be better about this. And like, I, I am letting you know that I messed up on this thing. Um, <laughs> and that was just like an interpersonal skill that I'm like, I'm trying to work on this. And so that's- yeah. That's something I think is important if you're trying to grow and be better. Totally. To be honest with you guys, I have students ask me a lot. So I don't know if maybe you can tell this from the podcast. I don't know. MCAT gets me hyped. Like I mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it. Talking about it brings a smile to my face. Like I, I truly have so many positive feelings associated with the MCAT. Um, and every time that I hold classes, again, I teach free classes. I teach uh our course students students. all the time. Um, So many times, I'm sure they've asked you this too, Phil, like, how are you excited about this? Like, how can you find it in you to be happy when you're talking about the MCAT? And to be honest with you, it's not because it was easy for me. The, The genuine reason is because it was so hard, right? The MCAT, I think, made me genuinely a much better person than I ever was in the past because... It was the first time for me, it was the first huge hurdle that made me fall on my face Mm -hmm. and say, wow, there are a lot of things that I could be doing better, that I could be doing differently. And it really made me shush everything else in my life and listen to myself and say, what do I need? Why, why is this not getting better? Like what, which of my needs are not being filled? Like how, how can I be better than I am now? And I will forever have that love and admiration for the MCAT because it's made me that way. And that then applies to everything else in your life. So know that as scary as this is, whether it's chemphys or it's biobiochem or psychosoc that intimidates you, that, that scares you and that you struggle to accept weaknesses in, um, know that coming out the other side and having accepted those struggles in those weak areas will make you a better human, not just a better doctor, although it certainly will make you a better doctor as well. Um, It just truly has changed my life. Um, And I I will always love it for that reason. Yeah, I know. It's strange, isn't it? It's weird. I remember finishing the MCAT thinking like, I'll never have to think about this ever again. And now I know here we are (laughs) to talk about it and think about it and like figure out like how to apply and also try to help you guys maybe avoid some of the the potholes that we stepped in and or pitfalls. That's a much better, (laughs) that's the word I'm looking for. Not potholes. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. So the, the the pitfalls and trying to avoid some of those problems and 
And that's exciting to us. That's why we we do this is to you know push ourselves to be better. And we're surrounded by people who are pushing themselves to be better. And that's that's like the most fulfilling thing we can do. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. We, 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 we went off the rails there a little <laughs> bit, totally but I think did. that it is, I think it's fine. I think it's interesting. It's always good to hear so. people who are passionate talking about whatever they're passionate about. Um, is my feelings. Um, we will be back next week and we're going to be talking about the biochem section. So Woo-hoo. there's some big differences in the biochem section. I think in some ways, bio biochem is the hardest section of the test. Um, but we're going to be talking about that a lot more next week. Um, in the meantime, keep pushing, keep diagnosing, keep, you know, spending time in those uncomfortable areas and it's going to pay off in the long run. Oh yeah. You will be a much better person in the long run. 